प्रश्न तो आपसे बहुत से पूछने हैं लेकिन थोड़े से पूछती हूँ ऊपर से भारत कैसा दिखता है आपको सारे जहां से अच्छा दीज वर्ड्स फ्रॉम स्पेस वर एच इन टू दमरी ऑफ इंडिया हिस्ट्री इट है 1984 was when uh, i was an infant on this planet and that is when the first indian broke the bounds of gravity and reached escape velocity to go to space that person back then was squadron leader rakesh sharma and now wing commander rakesh sharma who also received an ashok chakra and he was an inspiration to all of us Wing Commander Rakesh Sharma is a name which I first read in my GK books in school early on, and I heard this name from teachers and parents, and it was it was a name which inspired my generation, many generations, and generations which will come further. Wing Commander Rakesh Sharma is a person which is an inspiration to every Indian. It is a. Uh, it has inspired a quest of science and space in so many youngsters like myself in fact wing commander rakesh sharma was not only the first indian in space he is also the only indian with an indian passport indian citizenship to ever enter space reliving his moments from 1984 and onwards and also recalling his moments which led to this 1984 visit to space i am very proud to announce that he is joining us today in this live broadcast we'll be taking some questions from you i've also got some questions interesting ones and we'll all join him in getting that inspiration from the cosmic arena so i welcome my childhood hero your childhood hero the man in space the first indian to go to space Wing Commander Rakesh Sharma. Sir, welcome, welcome to our uh, show. It it's it's an absolute honor to have you, and uh, I must uh, say that you know, thirty six years have passed. It's almost the same as my age, and uh, so many things have happened. But uh, you know, the glory of seeing you in space and saying those verses, "Sahaj Jahan Se Acha." is something which resonates with all of us i welcome you today on behalf of the thousands of people who are hearing us and will be seeing this thing over and over again i welcome you and before i begin anything sir you are an absolute national gem you are an honor uh, to you know not inspire into a generation and perhaps even today's generation because when we did the survey thousands of the people who are in the audience today are actually people who were born at least almost two decades after you had already been in space so uh, it's my honor and uh, i would like to also state that uh, you are the only person the only indian citizen who has ever gone to space and of course you inspired uh, uh, more indians uh, who uh, went on into space uh, uh, later but the only citizen who remains to be in uh, who's ever gone to space is you so it's my honor to be with you so i wanted to know uh, you know before i begin my uh, space journey i want to know your journey you know uh, you know before space so you were also an air force pilot that's what your career was before after the space flight the space flight was an extension from going into the air to going to the space i want to know from your journey from patiala to salyut 7 the orbital station where you spent about 8 days i would like you to describe your journey you know from how you started as a childhood a lot of the audience today are children in school so i wanted to know how your journey began okay um uh, srijan with your permission i would like to say a few words about uh, <clears throat> since this invitation was received from the kalam center i uh, would like to pay my tribute to uh, president kalam and really speaking indeed he was the role model and continues to be the role model for the youth of india and i've had the privilege of working with him on the tejas for the light aircraft uh, project i worked very closely with him for a few years and so i do realize uh, 
uh, his contribution to science and also how closely he was interested in the students of our country. He fully realized what their potential was. And uh, it's a privilege really to be here, to be a part of this program. And uh, I salute him. And I must say that uh, he continues to be an inspiration, not only for us, but certainly for the youth of this country. So thank you for your kind words, Srijan. And to get back to your question, well, I uh, was born just uh, two odd years after partition and uh, my parents moved from Pakistan. My mother's from Abdabad, my father's from Multan and like uh, millions of others, they arrived at Patiala with a black trunk, their only worldly possession. And uh, I was born in Patiala, but uh, my father, who was in, uh, in um, Punjab National Bank, he was posted to Hyderabad. He kind of liked that place, and, and we settled down there. So I've done my schooling in Hyderabad. And uh, when I was about five or six years old, the... Uh, Vampire aircraft, which is the first jet aircraft fighter in the inventory of the Indian Air Force, started flying in the skies and the Indian Air Force procured vampires. Hakim Pate, which is located in Hyderabad, as you know, uh, trained, was a training establishment and one could see vampires flying overhead. Very intriguing because it was the first jet aircraft, unlike other propeller-driven aircraft, this one made a whistling sound and I was captivated by it. And of course, uh, I had a cousin who uh, was training on it. Unfortunately, uh, in an air crash, he passed away, which of course made my own journey into the Air Force that much more difficult because my parents had to were reluctant to give permission. But uh, the point I'm making is that that's when I got hooked to that aeroplane and uh, that obsession stayed with me right through my student days. Talking about my scholastic career, I, I, I won't say that it was particularly uh, uh, spectacular. I. Uh, uh, did spend most of my time standing on the last bench, punished, or looking out of the window when I should have been paying attention to the class. But, um, I mean, that's who I was. I was more interested in, uh, in outdoors, in sports. And, of course, uh, for me, it was more important to end up in the Indian Air Force. And uh, my aim in life was to... Uh, fly the vampire. So I just stuck to that and um, joined the National Defense Academy, got selected, uh, finished three years at the National Defense Academy, and uh, then got commissioned in uh, 1970 after my flying training. Uh, this, and uh, immediately I was selected to fly the MiG 21, which was the uh, latest supersonic aircraft uh, which joined the Indian Air Force at that time. And uh, so before my 23rd birthday, I found myself to be a MiG-21 pilot posted at a forward air base uh, when the 1971 war broke out. And uh, I found myself that before my 23rd birthday, I had completed 21 operational missions on the MiG-21 on the Western sector. Um, so everything has happened to me kind of early in life. And uh, three or four years later, I was selected to become a test pilot and um, then started my test flying career. And uh, that was how 
it qualified me because the selection for space happened to be from the list of test pilots okay. of the Indian Air Force. I see. Great. And who made the selection? Uh, was it done by the Air Force for the space flight or was it done by the government uh, separate agency? Well, the selection was uh, uh, done by the Indian Air Force, basically by the uh, by all the uh, uh, medic guys, medical guys. Uh, there's a whole heap of medical tests which had to be carried out. And, uh, and once that was done, um, then some of the Russian medical specialists came down from uh, the Soviet Union, the then Soviet Union, to check a subset of those results. And they whittled down the list uh, to four. And then four of us went to Moscow, were admitted in a hospital where a lot more medical tests were done, the equipment for which was unavailable at the Institute of Aerospace Medicine in Bangalore. And uh, at the end of it, so it was a bit like, uh, uh, what should one say, musical chairs. <laughs> and there were just the two of us left, uh, Ravish Malhotra, my boss at the test flying establishment and myself. And then both of us went to Moscow for our 18 month long training. So that really was how I found myself on the uh, Indo-Soviet space flight project in 1982. And uh, the flight itself, as you know, took place in 84, as you had mentioned earlier. And what kind of training do you go through for this 18 months? It seems to be a rigorous training for 18 months. So what well, the Yeah, the, the training itself essentially uh, took uh, about two months to learn the language. And that really was the most uh, difficult part. Uh, Russian language. Russian language. Yeah, so, so the language uh, was required because all the communication between... Uh, uh, ground control and ourselves was in Russian. Intercommunication with the crew was in Russian. So the knowledge of the language was very essential. And after that, of course, uh, we went through a very uh, difficult, I would say, phys uh, physical preparation. So as soon as we landed up our basal parameters of uh, speed, endurance, etc., were uh, recorded. And then uh, <clears throat> uh, Olympic uh, trainers were allocated for our physical training, and we went through very rigorous physical training, basically to develop our uh, muscles of the upper torso, because during launch, uh, you experience very high acceleration forces which yes. push you into the seat and uh, your body weight increases to three times its body weight and it presses down on the chest, making mm -hmm. it to breathe. The, the rib cage goes and uh, kind of reduces the space mm -hmm. for the lungs to expand. So it is necessary to get your muscles toned so that you can expand your chest and lock your muscles and create that space to overcome the acceleration forces. So uh, physical uh, training followed by a whole lot of work in the simulators uh, where we practiced our uh, entry, launch, um, docking, undocking, uh, re-entry procedures, which were very uh, long and complex, and we did all that practice in the simulators. So, uh, simple work, simulator work, learning up all the systems, ground subjects, all of this went into the uh, training aspect. But uh, uh, when when we were ready, the, they made sure that. Uh, you know, our, we were in peak physical condition 
and we had passed all our exams. We were comfortable with, uh, with the checks and procedures and um, the processes which were required to undertake the space flight. Absolutely. And would you recall the day when you were getting into the uh, space flight? That moment when you realized that in, in a few minutes or an hour or so, I'm going to be in space. Uh, what was that recall? Can you recall that day? that moment when you were entering into uh, the spacecraft and just getting ready and you knew that now this is going to happen in reality? <laughs> well, I, if I were to look for a parallel, it would be something like flying uh, an aeroplane for the very first time, like your first solo. And as a test pilot, uh, one has a lot of experience doing stuff that has never been done before. And therefore, um, in that sense, uh, the palpitations were under control. Uh, what was really uh, uh, top of uh, the mind and therefore uh, top of recall is that uh, I was full of curiosity, full of excitement, but the focus was total because it was the very first experience. And so concentration was absolutely total. So one looked forward to it with uh, great excitement and great curiosity. That's that's how it was. And of was course, we was were wanted to make sure that one doesn't screw up because one was wearing the national flag on the arm and we were representing the Air Force and the country, if you know what I mean. Of course. So that was the only fear. Yeah. No, no, there's no fear of space flight. Well, you know, that the um, concept of fear, one comes to term with pretty early in one's flying career. And this is so of every pilot. And I, and I say this because if one is incapacitated by fear, then one can never, ever perform up to potential. So... So we deal with this possibility uh, pretty early in our careers and uh, different people deal with it differently. And, uh, but by the time we start doing stuff which requires, well, uh, I won't call it extraordinary because it's done so often, but which is, okay, out of the ordinary, uh, I guess uh, we are, we, we train ourselves uh, pretty well to be able to undertake whatever we take on. Absolutely. Uh, that's a good quote. Incapacitation by fear makes one lose potential. I <laughs> remember that. So, absolutely. So, now I, I uh, want to go to that uh, you know, moment when you said that the, you know, when the space flight ascends, you feel uh, the genius in the chest and all that. You know, thing. How long is the flight from uh, the Earth? From the Russian uh, space station or the Ukrainian space station, I suppose now, uh, right. right into the boot. How, how much time does it take, and what was your feeling when uh, when uh, does it rumble? Does it shake? It seems like uh, in movies that's how it shows. And and does it suddenly you know enter into a silent zone once it you know escapes the environment or the atmosphere? How does it? How does it just take us to those whatever minutes of journey it is from Earth to space? So, um, like I said that. Uh, at launch, of course, uh, you do not have any visual cues because your launcher, the windows are covered um, by a shroud so that the whole launcher presents a clean aerodynamic profile as it mm -hmm. ascends. And there are, so there are no protuberances uh, to create drag. So you can't see much, unlike the shuttle where mm -hmm looking at the sky because the cockpit windows are there. So in this case, uh, the only uh, inputs you have are, are vibration, sound, because the engines are going full bore 13 stories below you, but the vibrations travel along the uh, uh, length of the launcher on the body, and, uh, and that's what you feel. So... Um, in effect, you are going blind, 
So all your other senses are naturally heightened. Uh, if there's a slight swaying of the launcher, then you hope that the automatic uh, correction system cuts in on time and straightens the launcher so that you can do heading in the correct direction. So these are the points of focus. Uh, this is what you observe. And as acceleration picks up, you start getting pushed into the seat, but you have trained for it in the centrifuge. So you are able to adopt those techniques so that you can continue to breathe. And uh, then you feel the first stage drop off, the second stage ignite, acceleration again, though not to the same level as earlier. Then the second stage drops off and the third stage ignites. And, and that's how you progress. And uh, once you reach your orbital height, the engines cut off in an instant and you go from being pushed into the seat to floating because that, there is zero gravity there, actually microgravity. And this happens in an instant. So suddenly you feel that you're hanging on your straps because you have left the seat and the straps are just holding you down. And you know you're in space. And then the orbit starts. And of course, then uh, like everybody else, the first thing you look out for is your own country. And uh, I must tell you that our country looks outstanding from space, and uh, which is what prompted me to say what I said. So describe how does India look from space? The great thing about India is that uh, we have everything. If you look at the uh, coastline, we've got a huge coastline, and uh, and that's visible from, from space. Uh, color contrasts, uh, the blue of the ocean, and uh, the uh, peninsula, which is just like a sand model, and the greenery of the guard section. And then you're moving from basically southwest to northeast, and that's the inclination of the orbit. Right. And you're moving up, and you're coming up towards the Deccan Plateau, which things start turning brown again, and then you're going further north and you are closing in onto, on the left side when you see that the desert golden colored desert sands are there, but move slightly more ahead, the green Gangetic plain is there. There are rivers, there are forests, uh, tropical forests, our northeast is, looks green and beautiful. And then you're coming up to the foothills of the Himalayas, which uh, appear purple from space because uh, Sunlight just cannot get into uh, okay. valleys, and uh, you know there are high mountains which are snow capped. So all in all, this is a brilliant site which you get to see uh, within about four minutes, and and then in the Himalayas park below you, mm -hmm. and then you come up for the next orbit. But when you come up for the next orbit, you have moved westwards because the earth has turned in the meantime. Hmm. So how many times you were able to orbit uh, over India? Was it like only once in eight days? Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, you know, we were able to orbit now, you, you make about 17 orbits in a 24 hour cycle. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, so you were able to come over the same track, same track. Uh, about two and a half days later. But uh, sometimes you're on the, uh, before that, you're sometimes on the eastern seaboard, sometimes halfway through, sometimes on the western seaboard. But to describe the very same track which you mm -hmm. had gone over every two and a half days, something like that. So, uh, so uh, a lot of people say that there are a few man-made structures which you can see from space. Well, were you able to spot any man-made structure from space? In any fact, yeah, it was said that uh, 
it is said that um, the Great Wall of China is visible. But, you know, whenever we were, we had crossed uh, the Himalayas, we were busy turning off our uh, equipment. We were busy uh, uh, all the experiments which we had done, noting down the results. So we were head down uh, doing work and, and I really didn't look out. But it's interesting. Uh, I'd like to share that you are unable to see a big city like Delhi or Mumbai uh, because it kind of merges with the color of the palette which is visible to you. But if there's a long railway line mm -hmm. uh, on a desert, what you need, what stands out is linearity and a mm -hmm. color contrast. Similarly, if there's an aeroplane, airliner flying over the ocean and the condensation trail, right. a white trail against a blue background, visible from space. The contrast makes it visible. Yeah, it's the contrast and the linearity. Yes. Right. Amazing. I never realized you can see airplanes from spacecrafts. <laughs> so. Not an airplane, or probably a minuscule dot uh, at, mm -hmm. the, at the edge of the white line. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. At least you, you, you had to know that all the big cities are invisible from space. So, doesn't it give you a feeling of. Except at night's region. At night. At yes. Lights up. The whole, the whole map lights up. Yeah. So, now I wanted to know that. I must tell you, I must tell you that uh, the western border of India is clearly demarcated because. East of that line is all lit up because India is electrified, whereas Pakistan was mostly in darkness because it's not was not as electrified as our country was. And of so course, it, it must be so in the India is. more stark. Yes. out in the night where the Indian border is. Sorry? I'm saying it's easier to figure out in the night than where lies India and where lies the uh, neighbor. That's right? correct. That's correct. So I wanted to know something, you know, you had uh, two more, uh, or how many space members you had there in the uh, space flight? You were three, four, how many were there? During my, during yes, my flight? Yeah. Yes. So, so we were three of us, two Russians and myself. And we went and docked with the salute. And at that point, there were three others in the salute, in the, in the space station. Because those guys at that time were trying to set up a, a world record for a long duration space flight. And ultimately, I think today the world record stands at 430 days. And uh, the Russians hold that record. But uh, while we were up, six of us in the salute, at that time from America, the space shuttle got airborne with five on board. So 11 human beings were orbiting planet Earth uh, during that period at the same time. That's one of the highest, I suppose, I mean, that, uh, even today. Uh, I, I, think, I think today's uh, record is 13, if I'm not mistaken. But I'm, yeah, I'm not big on record. You had a whole cricket team up in the air. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so, yes, sir. So Without, I wanted to know if you had left, sir. Without the twelfth man in our case. <laughs> yes, of course. Without the twelfth man, you had to do your own work, basically. Yeah. So, uh, you, you, when you up in salute, uh, you talked about yoga. You, you were in a way, uh, you know, the first uh, uh, interplanetary ambassador of yoga. So, what, what yoga did you used to do? Uh, I heard in one of your interviews that you used to perform yoga to stay healthy. Well. The uh, background is that uh, yoga was one of the experiments well, which was designed by the Indian uh, uh, doctors because idea was to find out uh, whether yoga offers a better alternative uh, for space crews to adapt to zero gravity. So 
the intention was to design an experiment where um, I stopped training as per the Russian system about two months before the launch. And uh, instead, I started doing only yoga. So my preparation for the space flight was using the yogic technique. But I must uh, put the record straight that the kind of asanas which I did were modified to kind of be relevant to the environment of zero gravity as imagined um, at that time. And therefore, uh, the purist would have got a, probably a bit horrified that they were not uh, classic, classic uh, uh, asanas. And uh, after that, I must say that uh, I prepared for that particular uh, way of uh, getting ready. And after that, uh, even during the flight, what happens is that during uh, zero gravity, uh, because you don't use your muscles, your muscles get wasted. So you need to continue to exercise uh, your uh, muscular system. And uh, remember that the heart is also a muscle. So Others would do the treadmill, etc. Whereas I just did yoga, even in space. And uh, so they recorded my medical parameters before launch. They recorded them during the eight day space flight and they recorded them after return and then compared it with uh, the Russian cosmonauts who continued to train as per their particular methodology and it was uh, similar did the results match uh... well you know um, they were inconclusive and actually we kind of knew they would be reason being that uh, uh, adaptation to space is a very subjective thing mm -hmm. it is it is something like travel sickness or air sickness not everybody gets travel sick not everybody gets sick. So similarly, not everybody gets space sick. So maybe I was one of those guys who wouldn't have got space sick anyway. So the, the sample data uh, statistically is really not valid to come to a conclusion. So uh, I had no problems adapting except for the usual ones uh, to zero gravity, nor did I have problems except for the usual ones to readapt towards gravity. But so was the case with the other more experienced Russian cosmonauts. I see. So uh, we uh, wanted to discuss with you some question from uh, a spirituality world. And uh, with me here is uh, Mr. Dinesh Ghotke. Dinesh ji is a, He's a teacher with the art of living, a senior teacher, and also an IIT Bombay graduate. So he's uh, he's on both sides, from, uh, being an engineering graduate and spirituality. And uh, he's been a teacher for 25 years. My pronouns to Wing Commander Rakesh Sharma ji. Sir, I have been an art of living teacher for the last 26 years. And many a times while conducting meditations, I tell my students to feel the space inside, the infinite space inside, or let your mind expand. So my question is that while physically moving through space at that level, how is it a spiritual experience for you? Also a connected question is, has courage played an important role in your being the man in space? Thank you. Well, I think that Basically, it, uh, it brings a realization of an individual's place in the universe. Uh, and, and that place is really infinitesimal when compared to the scale at which things actually are. And, and, and you see for yourself the scale on which things are. 
and uh, self importance tends to melt away if an experience of this type is processed objectively objectively so but at the same time i must qualify that by saying that we don't have to go to space to come by this feeling there is uh, enough and more documentary evidence to support the fact that uh, the universe is a vast place and really we have no business to feel self important and in control uh, we have attempted poorly to control nature on our planet and look what's happening similarly so these are the thoughts that go through one's mind and the other what is that boundaries are not visible from space national boundaries so there is that there is that underlying feeling of oneness which of course is a part of our innate uh, culture of vasudeva uh, kutumbakam so so these are the thoughts which pass through however i would say that one was so busy because this whole activity is uh, so darn expensive that each and every minute you're up in space uh, there is some task or the other to be done so i am sure that this question would be better answered by a crew member who's been uh, in space uh, on a long duration mission with hours and hours at his or her disposal to put the nose against the window and watch the beauty of of the earth and all that is visible and then reflect on on our true place in the universe great so with us uh, we have somebody joining in from sweden and uh, his name is dr ashok patel he's also a close friend of dr kalam and dr kalam and uh, he has visited dr kalam visited his place several times because he is one of the greatest uh, rural uh, innovators uh, the country has seen and, uh, several villages he worked with and uh, he's also an education officer and here's a question we have for you uh, about uh, something to do with environment it must be a great experience to see the earth from space without earthly problems no borders and but just a beautiful earth we have so many problems due to climatic change on earth what are your views in solving the issues related to climatic change in this powerless world so that we can make it a sustainable planet thank you um i think we need easy answer is that uh, uh we need uh, behavioral change to happen uh we have become such a consumptive society that uh, we are not at all bothered about the collateral effects of our consumption patterns essentially uh we are trying to live an unsustainable lifestyle on a planet that has limited resources and uh, and this is dumb for a species as evolved as we are i think you cannot expect the planet to keep producing something out of nothing which has been exploited at an alarming rate and i don't merely mean consumption of food and stuff i mean the collateral damage i mean i, I, I mean manufacturing well whether it's fast fashion or whether it is uh, chemicals and all the effluents which are going back it is the load that the planet has to sustain to cleanse itself is fast approaching that point where uh, our life on this planet 
is becoming unsustainable. So behavioral change, when I say, uh, easy to say, and I, I think extremely difficult to uh, achieve. And this is where I guess education comes in. And uh, this is where um, culture comes in. And, and I think we have abandoned that. And I think one of the um, culprits here really is uh, the economic model we follow. And essentially, this is a model which, which is coming from the West, where you want more and more growth quarter on quarter. I mean, if, if something becomes unsustainable to produce in the West because that society is bothered about pollution and you've got environmental laws uh, to make sure that uh, those laws are not contravened and suddenly your product becomes uh, is not competitive in the world market. You want you want access to the world market so that your quarter on quarter numbers uh, keep growing. And so you shift your manufacturing to countries where there, there are lax environmental laws or poor enforcement as has been happening. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and again, the load has to be carried by the same planet, the only planet we have today, uh, which is habitable. So, so that is what makes it unsustainable. Right. And I, I, you have beautifully put that, how economic models almost behave in a way that my pollution is my problem, your pollution is your problem, yeah. but it's our problem. And it's never our problem. So. Because the fact of the matter is that pollution does not respect national boundaries. Absolutely. Nobody has been designed, uh, able to design such a system yet. Yeah. But, but that's the oneness, I suppose, you see from space, and which, re which makes me recall one of the things which you pointed out from space was a forest fire in uh, Myanmar, I suppose, and you could see that smoke. Yeah, that is what I mean. That is what brought home to me that that pollution is no respecter of national boundaries because the upper air circulation moved the column of smoke away from Myanmar to the neighboring country. Exactly, and that just shows that how one we are and our problems, our assets and opportunities are all one. And I think more than any time uh, else in the world, uh, you know, the world is going through a pandemic. And yep. it just, that it's never one person's problem. One person's problem is everyone's problem. That's and right. I think that's, that's, right. The, that's the lesson of education we need from space. Uh, and which brings me to uh, another question is that, you know, we talked about education. India is, uh, well, we talked about the biggest uh, democracy dividend of India, the biggest youth population in the world. So where do you think uh, our education system needs to move to be competitive, in, in, uh, especially in technology, cutting edge techno technologies like that of space or say of nanosciences, they're all similar in the sense that they're all cutting edge. Where do you think we should take our education system to make it uh, more viable and more feasible in an environment which we're seeing for the world? You know, I've already told you that I did not, uh, you know, my scholastic career wasn't too great. But what I've learned from it is that we tend to focus much too much on committing the written word to memory. And then we are tested for its recall. But as students, we hardly practice the applicability of academic concepts in the physical world. I think that life and success in life is all about application of knowledge to find solutions to real life situations. So as students and during our school and college education, we are rarely challenged to do path-breaking de novo uh, design and translating that mental imagery we have as designers uh, into intuitive thought and then translating it into ground reality. So 
you know, startup is a good idea, but then you know, if such a high percentage fizzles out, then something is not right with our training, with our with our education system. So to be global, globally competitive today, I think we have to not only ideate, we have to design, and we have to manufacture in double quick time, really, uh, to keep pace with the rate at which uh, innovation has begun to move. So these are the precise areas, I think, uh, we need to plug into our education. That's my, my humble belief, because when I look back at my career, I've had the uh, good fortune <laughs> of, of ending up in areas where uh, I really should have questioned, listen, I don't have the, uh, the, uh, the skill sets for this. I've never trained for it. And I, I find myself much too early in my work to, to end up in these areas. But when I finally did uh, uh, go into it, uh, I found that things were never half as difficult as I had imagined them to be. And I found that more than anything else, I was using common sense to, to kind of understand and solve problems. And well, that has held me in good stead. Maybe I was lucky, but there it is. That's my learning. I agree. You well put it. I think uh, so one of the things which I've always been stressing is that, uh, so Dr. Kalam and I, we wrote uh, this book, sir. Uh, this is Dr. Kalam's final book. It's called uh, Advantage India. And in this book, uh, we basically talked about uh, the half-life of knowledge, which said that uh, everything at the cutting edge of technology has a half-life of 13 months. So in 13 months, at the cutting edge of technology, whatever I know, half of it is useless. Yeah. And in a BTEC degree, which is four years, by the time you cross fourth year, about 87% of what you were taught in first year has become redundant or useless or has been replaced by something. So I think the education system, the pattern in which it is taught itself has to now transform, especially for the cutting edge sectors. And that is something which Dr. Kalam also advocated. And I think you also rightly put it. Innovation is at the heart of it. And the I, I think the ability to allow students to think uh, you know, away from the proven path because Otherwise, it's just a rote learning and a memory recall test. That's uh, that's the sad part, which I think we all need to work. Now, before we uh, move forward, I'll take a short break here. And for a minute, we're going to see some of the footage and clippings from all that what Wing Commander Rakesh Sharmaji did while he was on his aid. Hello, sir. So we saw some uh, clips from your journey in space. And uh, now I'm going to broadly uh, open up the questions for the audience uh, in the next uh, round. And we've got uh, some guests here who've been waiting uh, for a long time. And they've been, uh, so there are two or three kinds of people. One who's, uh, there, there's some who have won a quiz competition. Thousands of entries were received. It was a science quiz. And there are others who have also joined in uh, to ask you questions uh, through various platforms, which we have uh, Vision and uh, what I'll do, sir, is um, I'm going to start off. Uh, uh, I'm going to bring in Samrat Sharma. Samrat Sharma, sir, he's a senior correspondent with Indian Express Group, and he's uh, he's also a space enthusiast, journalist who's a space enthusiast, and he's going to ask you the first question. Samrat, over to you. Hello, sir. I'm uh, Samrat Sharma, and I'm a business journalist. Uh, it's a huge pleasure to be in front of you, sir. Uh, so there are two questions that I want to ask. The first one is, uh, though you must have gone through many rehearsals and trainings and trials before going into the space, but once you went there, what was that one thing that surprised you the most? So uh, this is my first question. So uh, uh, my second question is, uh, now that private companies, uh, you were uh, talking about the education system and the new technologies, now that the private companies are allowed to use ISRO's uh, facilities and space exploration projects, how much do you think this will help India's uh, exploration projects? Great question, sir. 
Well, um, answering your first question first, what really surprised me was how well we had been trained in the sense that uh, everything was like any other day in the office. Uh, because we were so well trained from the standpoint of uh, procedures that there was nothing which really was new. And uh, the only difference, of course, was that we could replicate the environment of, of space uh, on Earth. So uh, what was surprising was that how difficult it is to work in space. You know, uh, it's wonderful to visit space, but you, if you have to work there, that takes some doing. Uh, and the reason for that is that uh, you're floating around, so is everything else around you. So, it, and you've got just two hands. And uh, when you are working, say, a camera or, or some equipment, then uh, in between those stages, you have to make sure that you either, you know, uh, push it against a Velcro or an elastic strap. Otherwise, you find it, you know, moving away, it moving away from you. So everything has to be done sequentially. And uh, you can't really work parallelly and leave this here. And while it is, it stays there. It doesn't stay there. It, it flies away. So, so that was uh, the uh, one surprising thing. Uh, and the other point which you mentioned is about the uh, private sector having uh, given access, uh, which I think is, a, is, is really a good thing because uh, uh, I'm a believer that there's really no need uh, having discussed on uh, sustainability earlier uh, in the program, I really believe that it's really not done to have everybody replicate the facility if it is available. Yes, uh, if work increases to a level where those facilities are being utilized, uh, uh, you know, uh, and they're not available when they're required, then then that's different. Yes. But I don't think we've reached there. Thank you, sir. Uh, so I'll move on to the uh, next question. And the next question uh, is uh, coming from uh, a very uh, special person who's, uh, who's actually, sir, a drone designer. So he's also known as uh, one of the drone men of India. And he's into drone manufacturing and uh, a young scientist. His name is uh, Milind Raj. And he's joining us from Lucknow. So, Milin, uh, would you like to shoot your question? Uh, what's your question? Yeah. Milin, yeah, Milin, 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 can you just hang on for a minute? I have sure. my, my dog here who wants to be let out. Otherwise, sure. I should disturb sure. our one. Right. Well, dogs were one of the few species which went into space to begin with. We yeah. all know. Was the one. Sorry, Milan. Please go ahead. Yeah. By the way, sir, that I also designed a drone that rescued a dog from a drain. And that was the world's first drone dog rescue. Oh, wow. Well, look at that. I think that's a yeah. nice way to enter your question. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, sir, uh, like uh, I'm basically a UAV developer and programmer. So, my question is that uh, like drones are tackling everything from disease control to delivering goods. So, so like India somewhere has lagged behind in this drone technology if we compare to the rest of the countries. So, sir, how can India stand ahead of the world in drone technology in the future? Well, I I, I think your question really is a subset of what we had touched upon earlier, uh, that is uh, innovation, that is our education system, which, is, which does not challenge us. And uh, really speaking, what we need is a lot more agility in changing curricula. And I think that is what is the key, because technology is changing so fast. 
And the reason why we are lagging is primarily because, uh, well, I would say we have not been creating the umbrella, the environment, which, uh, which uh, nurtures uh, innovative thought and execution. And uh, I think also that culturally, we are very risk averse, you know, in the sense mm -hmm. that we do not, mm -hmm. the failure is not taken kindly by all concerned. And uh, I don't think that that is uh, uh, peculiar to India as such. I think it's, uh, it's a part and parcel of, of developing economies when you don't have enough money, naturally you want to extract the maximum bang from your buck. So, so that's what happens. However, if you don't make mistake, you will not learn. Uh, of course, the trick really is to uh, simulate. I think we, we do not uh, believe enough in simulation. And uh, there are cheaper ways of uh, proving uh, concepts. And I think we need to give adequate thought to the very process of innovating so that it becomes viable uh, financially and otherwise. Right. Thank I you. I answered your question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Milan, for your question. Thank, and thank you. you for joining from all the way from Lucknow. So next, yeah. uh, uh, we have um, uh, someone who's a real fan and who's been chasing me from the day we started and is in participating regularly in all the events. And his name is Aman Mishra. I think he's joining from Calcutta, and uh, he's a book. Uh, he's a, he's a he's an avid reader of many books and a fan of yours. And he's he's got a question for you. Aman, go ahead. You're joining from Calcutta or in Delhi? Which side are you? Quite to speak with you. Uh, I've, I've followed your career for quite some time. Uh, my question is that uh, you know people generally have two conflicting views. You know, either we can eventually move to other planets or, you know, either there is no planet B. So, you know, uh, uh, what is, what, what do you feel about these uh, opposing arguments? Well, uh, it is, it's, it's like this. Uh, uh, if there is something that needs to be explored that hasn't yet been explored, we as a species will take it upon ourselves to explore because that's who we are. It's in our DNA to explore. So go we will. We will attempt to, to inhabit another planet. And, uh, and I believe that uh, we must have a fallback option. If I were to give an example, I think we are more bothered about uh, saving our data we have no backup and no way for the human genome to be saved in the event, shall we say, of a cataclysmic uh, uh, happening, say an asteroid hitting planet Earth. So uh, we do need another place uh, really where the human genome can uh, flourish. My only worry and uh, concern is that we really need to sort out the way we live, learn sustainability, which we still are on the learning curve on our planet before we go and build another planet. And that's what I think we should be doing. So uh, we shouldn't be in a hurry. Uh, or alternatively, we must have watertight protocols which prevent us from messing up a place which otherwise is pristine. So going and inhabiting another planet is, I think, uh, an opportunity that is being given to us, but uh, no point rushing into it. And, uh, and I think we really need to fix all that is wrong, uh, all that we have let happen in this planet before we go and inhabit another planet. But yes, we will go, we will inhabit the moon. It's there, it's within reach, that will happen. 
Thank you, sir. Uh, I do have a question. 2035, sir, we are planning to inhabit Mars, not just the moon. And as you rightly said, space debris is an example of uh, what we are already experiencing in space, or what you had pointed out. And now there's a global effort to uh, figure out what to do with the space debris itself. So I, I need to move on, Aman. Thank you for your question. Uh, we sure. have uh, sir, a very special guest has uh, come just to talk to you. And uh, his name is uh, Professor Vinay Patek. And Professor Vinay Patek is the Vice Chancellor of Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam University. And uh, he's joining us. Uh, this university, sir, is the world's largest technology university, it produces more engineers than any other university in the world. I think about uh, 400,000 uh, students are there, engineering students with them. And uh, Professor Patek is here. He's joining us from Lucknow. Thank you, Professor Patek. Uh, you can go ahead with your question, sir. Thank you, Srijan, and uh, welcome, uh, welcome, Commander. Uh, Rakesh Sharmaji and I remember that day when you went to the space and there was a live program and I, we all as students in class 10th have seen that program uh, when Honorable Late Prime Minister asked you ki aapko Bharat kaisa dikhta hai aur aapne bola tha ki sare jahan se achha. So I remember those days and down the memory lane, it was a real exciting day of our life and uh, uh, I remember that day and I was thrilled again to see you uh, with those kind of memories. Uh, my basic question is, uh, uh, although when uh, some astronaut goes ahead, uh, some events like what you have uh, went to the space and it has happened in this country. A uh, lot of students do feel that uh, space and uh, studies uh, uh, according to the space is uh, an interesting field and a lot of uh, people wants to take their career. But then over a period of time uh, as a universities, we don't have that curriculum uh, which is exciting and people go. So what is your take and uh, what do you think uh, give a recipe that a lot of students should take uh, in their career the space studies and they really want and uh, we should have space city, space uh, studies as a curriculum and uh, go and pursue our degrees and uh, do work in that area. That's my question. Uh, well, sir, it's, uh, it's a very uh, complex question, I would say, primarily because uh, um, the problem is that if you think back, and all of us have been, uh, in a way, uh, we've been doing this bhed chal, you know, which is that uh, uh, when I was young, uh, the professions which one could choose from, everybody wanted to become a doctor or uh, an engineer. Uh, these were very generic terms. Uh, I think what we really need to do is to first try and identify what is our passion. Uh, and I say this because going up into space and working in, in that environment is uh, really not for people who are looking for a glamorous uh, or an interesting job. It, uh, you really need to be driven uh, by a passion. And uh, so therefore, uh, and, and the openings are going to be many, as we just described, if you're going to be inhabiting uh, an as yet uninhabited uh, place, then uh, you're going to recreate uh, everything, whether it is a building, whether it is uh, um, environment control systems, uh, because the human body really cannot uh, exist. In, in those environments as, as we find them, uh, moon certainly not, and Mars most definitely not. So, so, so really, uh, it, it, it's not as simple as people climbing Everest because it was there. Yeah, yes, uh, space is there, but uh, working in space is really uh, not the same. You, it's a whole different way of living and uh, it's not going to be easy. So your motivation levels have to be somewhere else, which we are not used to, which is why I'm underlining the fact that only if you have passion must you enter this life. And, uh, and of course, um, the corollary to that is that uh, in, 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 in today's world, we are all looking for a cushy job, a corner office, 
And uh, I believe that uh, there are other ways of being fulfilled, and that is to be involved with a team which is doing cutting edge work. So if you find yourself uh, in, in that kind of a team, then I think you should consider yourself fortunate. Otherwise, uh, you're going to spend your life uh, on a desk, uh, you know, which is well paying, but money will take you only that far. That, that's not the case. Great Thank you very much for your thing, and we wish you a great health. And thanks, Regent, for uh, letting me in uh, to ask a question from a celebrity whom I felt celebrity uh, in class tenth. I was uh, when I have seen you as an astronaut, and uh, thank so best of luck for you. Thank you. Uh, in fact, uh, just about celebrities, I just hold on. Uh, so, sir is a is a recipient of the Ashok Chakra and the hero of the Soviet Union. So he's a, <laughs> yes. he's a hero in two countries. So truly international. Uh, I, I think hero in the heart of uh, law, many Indians, that is the most kind of the medal he has got. So all those medals are temporary, but if you live in the hearts of Indians, it's one of the medals. That's what I feel. I truly agree with you, sir. And I am blessed, really, uh, to have received the love of so many Indians. And I, I say that because I'm absolutely amazed that even today when I visit IITs and IIMs and the Indian Institute of Science and the National Institutes of Learning, what I'm amazed about is the level of interest which I observe amongst students who weren't even born uh, when this event took place. But that really tells us the amount of interest the subject generates. Uh, however, um, I, have, I hope that I've been able to put it into perspective for the students. They must know what they are getting into. And of course, we need many more. We have the brains. We just need the industry to reach Absolutely. where we want to reach. Also, I, and I think, uh, you know, once uh, this is uh, the coronavirus is over, I think, uh, sir, you should uh, invite uh, Vinka Mandir Rakesh Sharma to address all our 4 lakh students. I think that will be course. a wonderful thing to do. Of right. course, uh, in, the, in the pandemic, see, uh, things, uh, I think you have done an amazing and wonder work. You have connected everybody. So yeah. nature, right. one way it is giving a disease, but another way it is connecting a lot of lost people. So thanks to Corona also that we got everybody. You are very positive. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you. thank you. How you process problems in life. Quite right. right. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So I'll move on to a next uh, question. And uh, that comes from a child, actually. Uh, you know, there's a class five student we have. Her name is uh, Dayanta Sanjay Patak. She's a class five student from Mumbai. And uh, so I think she's the youngest questionnaire we'll have so far. So uh, why don't people, uh, Dayanta Sanjay Patak. My name is Dianta Patak. I'm a student of ISRI in school, grade five. Wing Commander Sharma, so my question is, did you look at the moon from the space station? How do moon and other planets look from space? And uh, I must tell you that uh, uh, the moon and other planets are very, very far away. And I was only about 500 kilometers closer to those objects than others on Earth. So if you compare the scale, it isn't as if I had gone very close to them. So therefore, it's not the size which, which made things appear bigger. But yes, they were a bit clearer because unlike the rest of us who are back here on Earth, I was not viewing these objects through that polluting layer of the atmosphere because we were above the atmosphere and we were in a vacuum. So therefore, uh, the, the, the light rays uh, did not get refracted and, and we were able to see, say, stars and uh, these planetary uh, objects uh, without them twinkling. So they were just clearer and that's really the only difference. And uh, it wasn't that as if they were 
bigger or something. But you're at a wonderful age. I must tell you that I developed a passion for flying when I was your age. So find your passion and stick to it. And you have a wonderful life ahead. A uh, lot of changes are going to happen in your lifetime. The human species will probably go out of planet Earth and settle elsewhere. So be prepared for that. Absolutely. In fact, your age is the exact age where Dr. Kalam developed a passion to become a pilot. And unlike uh, Pink Commander Rakesh Sharmaji, he could not become a pilot, but he went and, went and become a president, so, which is also pretty good. <laughs> yes. Whatever so, happens, happens for the best. All right, good. Right. So I'm going to bring in Somitra Singh. Somitra is joining us from Kanpur, and uh, he has a question for you. And uh, Somitra, go ahead. You're from Kanpur. Uh, go ahead with the question. Yeah, thank you. Hello, sir. Good evening. Hi, Somitra. Uh, as a food industry uh, and the taste is everything for me and for the Indians uh, the taste so I just want to know that uh, in the space you took the food fr from here from the earth what is the taste look it's say same like earth or like it's a different taste like uh, more I just uh, heard about it uh, like you people eat chocolates and only so what is the taste of the salt and uh, sugar what other tastes is it same like, like a... Go ahead, complete your question. Sorry, I but yeah, uh, This is my only question that is it same like Earth or... Well, it's like this. Um, uh, we do not have the means to cook in space right now. We do not yeah. have the means to grow anything in space right now. So we have to carry our food into space. And... Uh, the, therefore, we have to be careful about the uh, uh, biomedical aspects, uh, the preservation of foods so that it does not go bad. So preservatives are added to it. And the consistency, say, we, we had a choice uh, where we could choose from amongst 80 dishes, 8-0. So it was... Uh, a, a pretty mm -hmm. hard. And uh, uh, so we could decide what we wanted to eat. And we had an oven on board. And we used to put it in the oven and heat it up and, uh, and have a hot meal. Uh, say if it was rice, if it was a palau that you wanted to eat, the grains were such that they would stick to each other. Otherwise, they would be flying around. So mm -hmm. you had carve a spoon of rice and then put it in your mouth. So these modifications were done. You asked me about taste. Uh, again, it's a subjective thing. But personally, uh, what happens is that, uh, you know, your tongue kind of swells up because there's blood rushing to the head in zero gravity. Your taste buds kind of come alive and uh, like I uh, I have always been fond of mustard but uh, I, I loved having mustard in space uh, yeah. what you want is some kind of mm -hmm. art uh, taste to uh, come along with the food but like I said it's a very it's a subjective thing so uh, we had a great time eating yeah, yeah. 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 So I drinking water. Drinking water is very complicated in space, I've heard. Sorry? Drinking water is very complicated in space, it seems. Well, it is complicated in the sense, uh, like everything else, and if it spills, then it will float around because the surface tension of the water will keep it like a sphere and uh, it's going to move around. And you don't want it to enter into equipment Mm -hmm. stuff on the spacecraft. So it's not that water has never spilled in space before. The thing is, if you try to catch it, then it breaks into so many more spheres. Uh, you break the surface tension and you have mm -hmm. more smaller spheres. Like, like, like mercury, like, like it happens with mercury here. Oh, absolutely. So um, the best thing to do is to put your mouth to it and suck it up. Great. Okay. Great. Thank you, Samitra, for your question. I, uh, Thank you. I'll bring in, 
Thanks, Amitra. I'll bring in another young audience. Uh, she's from class 7th. Her name is uh, Sanvi Kashyap, and she's from DPS Gurgaon, class 7th. Hi, Sanvi. Ask Hi, your question. Sir. Hi, Hi, sir. I just wanted to ask that how uh, the what were the medical issues that you experienced after landing? Well, um, after landing, what happens is uh, let me rewind a bit and I'll tell you what happens when you go up into space. Uh, into space, when there's no gravity, uh, I've already explained that too much blood goes up to your yes. upper extremities, and uh, of course, the human body uh, uh, being a wonderful uh, uh, self-correct system uh, slows down the heartbeat so that uh, you know you're able to tolerate the extra uh, fluid in the head and uh, now after eight days when you do return uh, you're back in gravity and uh, the heart continues to work at the new slow pace which it had adjusted to zero gravity so now what happens is that the blood enough blood doesn't reach the head so the pressure uh, has to increase all over again and that is the period of readaptation which is opposite of the period of adaptation to zero gravity so the effect in the body <clears throat> is that uh, you feel uh, lightheaded uh, because uh, you feel a bit giddy initially. Uh, but like I said, the great thing about the human body is that it quickly gets up to speed and adjusts to the, to the new environment which it is used to uh, in any case. Great. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you Sammy, for your question. Thank you for joining. Sir, uh, I'm going to ask you a question uh, which uh, I don't think anybody has raised right now. But, you know, from, from my uh, knowledge of what I've gathered is that the most risky phase of any space voyage is the descent, not the ascent. And that's where things are very dangerous as well. Uh, could you explain after eight days almost in space, what was your journey back to Earth? Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was... Uh, it was like Diwali, uh, in the sense that uh, uh, we deorbited, and uh, essentially, once you uncouple from the uh, from the space station, you're at that moment traveling at the same velocity as the space station, which is close on to seven point four kilometers per second. Yeah. Now, uh, that is what is keeping you at that height. Right. So now to come back, basically what you need to do is turn around 180 degrees so that the exhaust uh, end of the engines, when you light it, instead of accelerating you, it decelerates you. Right. And it decelerates you enough for the Earth's gravity to start pulling you back uh, more and more. So it is a carefully calibrated maneuver because that is what is going to decide the re-entry angle. And the re-entry angle is what is going to decide whether your re-entry is going to be survivable or not. If it is too flat, then you bounce back and uh, and keep saying, you know, yeah. Uh, if it is too steep, then the skin friction is so high that you burn up. But if things are going right, as as they usually do, uh, you start uh, feeling those G-forces because now you're being decelerated. Only you're coming back as a projectile and you're encountering denser and denser layers of the atmosphere. And uh, the shape of the uh, capsule is such that you present a flat plate to the atmosphere. And the drag uh, is what slows you down. And uh, the skin friction is there, but you have a heat shield protecting you from the front. And the heat shield is uh, made up of many layers of ablative material. 
So the layer which is right ahead, which is exposed to the atmosphere, starts singeing, starts burning up, and through the windows, this time the windows are not covered as they were on launch. Mm -hmm. And through the windows, you are able to see small little sparks. And while you are watching, it becomes bigger and small balls of fire. Finally, there are sheets of flame which are covering the window. And uh, each layer burns up, flies off, exposing the next layer. And that's how it goes. And uh, by the time you come down to about 30,000 feet, uh, what happens is that uh, you are slow enough for the parachute shock load to, mm -hmm. to be survivable. And uh, your feet and capsule is under that parachute. It's a huge parachute, a thousand square meters in diameter. And uh, that is what uh, now protects you. Now, from that point onwards, of course, you are at the mercy of the local winds. And uh, when you come down, we are about a meter from the ground. Uh, there's a feedback a radio altimeter, which automatically fires your retro rockets to cushion your landing. And uh, so, so really speaking, there's a lot of uh, G forces because that's how you're being uh, braked. There's a so lot of which one is more, uh, which one is uh, more uncomfortable, and which one is easier, taking off or coming back? In terms well, of uh, which you feel? I, it's much faster to come back. So, so this doesn't last for very long. Uh, <coughs> launch. What happens is that once you establish yourself in orbit, then there is a long period uh, where the phase angle between yourself and the space station is allowed to decrease so that uh, you don't expend more fuel in trying to catch up uh, with the space station. So once you are aligned and the phase angle is reduced, then you start making your approach towards the space station. Uh, but there are no such constraints when you're returning. So uh, you you just come straight down and, uh, and you, you bear uh, this kind of a the discomfort and and watch this wonderful view through the window and uh, when the parachute opens it's uh, it's uh, it's again uh, <laughs> something which is unusual because um, there's a whole lot of noise in that bell-shaped capsule and you just hope that the parachute doesn't part company with the capsule yeah a lot of anxiety is there yeah so because if it does then you continue the rest of your flight as a projectile, which is not survivable. Right, sir. I, I would have ended with this question, sir, but there's one question which a lot of people are asking here in the comments. And that question is slightly difficult to answer. But the question is, uh, do you think we are alone in this universe? As a living species, do you think Earth is the only alive planet? Or do you believe that there may be uh, species which are alive maybe in different forms on other planets as well? I have so Convinced that we are not alone. To You're say not, we are alone, yeah, not alone. Absolutely, I agree with you. To say that we are alone is uh, is evidence of the arrogance of the human race. You know, we, we consider ourselves much too intelligent. Uh, had we been intelligent, we wouldn't have let planet Earth to come to the state in which it is. I'm saying environmentally, sustainability-wise. Uh -huh. uh, so, really speaking, uh, we cannot be alone. The universe is a vast place. And to think that we are the only intelligent species, well, is very unintelligent. Absolutely. In fact, there are 100 billion galaxies with 100 billion stars each. Each star will have 10 planets on an yeah. average, and that's a huge number. And I yeah. think uh, somebody said that uh, if we are alone on this planet, then why? Uh, because we are made of exactly the same things which uh, the universe is made of. Hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, which is abundant in the universe. So uh, it, it makes sense for us to believe that there may be life which may even be intelligent uh, the way we believe to be intelligent. Maybe they, we are too dumb for them, so they don't visit us. <laughs> but maybe once we acquire that level of intelligence, we'll do that. Yes, I understand. Uh, sir, uh, sorry, I, I interrupted.
I said, that's understandable that they don't want to make contact because we are dumb. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so now, uh, as we come to a close, it's been an hour and a half, uh, a fascinating discussion. We've talked about your journey, your takeoff, your uh, things which you did there uh, in the, in the uh, spacecraft and the landing station. I wanted to know that, you know, now that uh, you are here uh, uh, and you look back, reflect back so many years, 36 years have passed. Uh, I belong to a generation which was born in the year when you made your trip. And I just wanted to know, what is the message to the youngsters of India? A lot of people have asked so many questions. I wish I could take them. But they've asked how to become a space scientist. How can I go to space? What should I do now? What should I do for my education? If you have a composite message for all of these people who we could not take questions, but at least uh, 100 such questions have come uh, while we were discussing. What is your message for the young people, the young Indians? Well, I, 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 I believe that I have touched upon, uh, you know, there were bits and pieces which I referred to during uh, my interaction. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so the only thing I would request the students to not look at this as just another career. Uh, space science, yes, there are many, many disciplines. Uh, in the sense, you can be a researcher on ground. You can uh, you can uh, get the skill sets that are required to maybe go up into space and work there. Uh, like you know, there are so many disciplines when you're setting up, say, a new township. There are various uh, skill sets required to set up a new township. Now, the very same skill sets uh, will be required when when we do move. So choose what your passion is, uh, but uh, be very clear that uh, uh, this is not going to be easy. So uh, if you are looking at this as, as just, just another career because everything else has become so competitive back here, think again, because uh, you know what you are going to probably gain in, in ease of doing, uh, is, is going to be imagined. It, it won't be so, really. There are other challenges. So um, unless you're motivated enough to do that, to take it on, uh, it's, it's, it's better to, you know, like I said, it's, uh, it's a great place to visit. It's a difficult place to work in. And there's no place like planet Earth, which is why uh, I want to leave you with the thought that we really need to protect our planet. It's the only planet we have, and in the foreseeable future, it's the only planet that we will ever be able to enjoy. Absolutely, sir. Thank you. I think uh, while we uh, set our eyes into the skies and into the space, our feet must remind us that this planet is our mother. It's our mothership. It's our mother planet. And so far, it's the only mother which takes care of us and embraces us. And yeah. we should embrace it back with love, affection, and compassion. And I think uh, the recent crisis has only taught uh, us to be together and in oneness. And in the fact that all our problems, our challenges, and opportunities uh, are shared goals. So thank yeah. you for your time, sir. It, sir, thank you yeah, for the, your time. One other point I would like to make is that, uh, you know, what has happened is that an astronaut is, is the visible tip of an iceberg. Uh, and if you think that becoming an astronaut is, is, is everything, uh, spare of thought for all the others in the pyramid who have contributed to make space flight happen. And when I say that it is equally fulfilling to occupy any slot in that pyramid, that is exactly what I had meant. That it's as long as you can be a part of that pyramid, which is doing uh, stuff like this, cutting edge stuff, I think you should be happy that, that you are doing that, you've been selected for that, and you're excelling in that. Absolutely, thank you, sir. Wonderful words to uh, sort of leave us with, and I'm sure a lot of people are inspired for one and a half hours, thousands of people 
have been watching this uh, and uh, I'll, I'm sure that, you know, I, I'd love to meet you someday soon and get you again here on talk on so many other topics. It's just fabulous that your knowledge and your views are, are so diverse. I think uh, uh, it's not just related to space. I think space is inspired in so many other dimensions. So it was great uh, for your time, sir. You gave us an hour and a half, I, I, and I'm absolutely thrilled and thankful for you to do that. I would also like to thank my team, uh, which is uh, here. Uh, Preksha is here, uh, Vishaka, and uh, we've got Miraz. All of these uh, young uh, boys and girls from different, uh, you know, places actually now because it's all work from uh, you know home model. Uh, they've been working tirelessly. So thank you to all uh, three of you. And, uh, you only made it possible. Thank you, sir, for your, your time once again. And uh, thank you. Namaskar, sir. Good night. Thank you, every all viewers as well. Thank you. Look after yourselves. Stay safe. And like everything else, this too shall pass. God bless. Thank you, sir. Namaskar.